Uh, I, uh, like like uh, Haley said, I'm, a, I'm an experimental uh, astrophysicist, so which means I build, uh, design and build and field and very special cameras uh, for looking at the universe uh, and how it evolves over over cosmic time, and uh, and it's it's uh, it's a real challenge uh, because the universe is really big. You probably figured that out already, and uh, and to understand what it's doing is not just a matter of going and looking at a bunch of objects. You have to go and really look at the whole thing. It's a really big picture and see how it all fits together. Uh, again, over enormous time scales from the beginning of the universe, which is 13.7 billion years ago, to the universe that we see today. Wow. So that, that is a sort of a, a, big, a big scope of your job there. Aria was wondering what an astrophysicist is just in general. Oh. Second. So you can say that one question. Last question oh, again. Oh, we did freeze a little bit. Um, Aria was wondering what is an astrophysicist in general? Oh, well, uh, an astronomer uh, will basically use a telescope to go and look at an object. They want to look at a star, a distant star, or a distant galaxy to understand its properties. Uh, an astrophysicist, now remember, my degree is in physics, not in astronomy, uh, is basically more physics-oriented way of asking the questions about the universe, not just saying, you know, is the sky blue or is the star hot or cold, uh, it's more uh, looking at it as a system, as a, uh, you know, how does it evolve as a, as a physical system with gravity involved and, and light and matter and how do they all interact? And it requires a little bit more, um, in, you know, mixing of the two fields than, than you would just astronomy and physics on their own. Well, you were talking about the special cameras that are on uh, your telescopes. What, what are those cameras? What are they looking at? Okay. So... That's a big question, so let me let me try and uh, um, uh, help you out with that. So when you go look in the night sky, you basically will probably see stars, if anybody's ever had a chance to look up when the lights are out. And those stars are emitting light that, that your eyes can see, and uh, that's in what we call the optical part of the spectrum. It's where visible light is, you know, red and blues and greens and so forth. That's what your eyes are, are calibrated to see. But light comes in all sorts of different wavelengths and, and frequencies uh, and colors. Uh, and some of them your eyes can't see. Uh, you probably have uh, you know, heard about people putting infrared goggles on so they can see at night or are using infrared cameras to see the thermal emission from people and objects. You may have seen those in, your, in some of your classes or when you go to a museum. Uh, those emissions come from things which are colder. In other words, our sun is very hot uh, and it puts out visible light. But if you look at an object which is colder, like for example a uh, uh, you know, a dark planet that's not being illuminated by a star, uh, it puts out light at a, at, from, its, from this colder temperature, which winds up being at longer wavelengths, wavelengths that our eyes can't see. If you start taking that to the more extreme, the, the, the light becomes cold, you know, from objects becomes colder and colder and colder. And uh, in, in my, from my perspective, the photons have much, much less energy for each one. So I can't buy a camera. I can't use my cell phone camera to take a picture of the sky to see what I want to see. I have to actually look wavelength and use detectors for detecting the light that, that we don't have access to as, as humans. And the detectors we use are actually called uh, bolometers, uh, and bolo stands for heat and meter stands for, for meter. And so what we're doing is we're measuring the heat that comes from different objects. And uh, a very simple example you can use for this. You know, if you were to go outside, it's cloudy here in Philadelphia today, but if you were to go outside when it's sunny out and close your eyes and hold up your hand and say, where is the sun? your hand could find where the sun was. Your hand is a bolometer, it's a heat meter. It says oh, the sun is over there, it's not over there. And, and that works because your hand is relatively cold compared to, uh, compared to the sun. But if I ask you to go out at night and find the moon, the full moon, assuming it's up the same way, you'd have a very difficult time doing that because your hand actually turns out to be roughly the same temperature as the moon and you don't have enough sensitivity for that. But if you were to dunk your hand, don't do this by the way, in a vat of liquid nitrogen and cool it down so it's completely frozen and you held it up again, well then this, the moon would seem blazingly hot compared to your hand and you would be able to detect it. We have the same problem except the objects we're looking at are much colder than the moon. Uh, they're just a few degrees above absolute zero. And so we have to cool our detectors down to of a degree above absolute zero in order for them to be sensitive to these cold objects. What? That's amazing. <laughs> Well, we have a question from Elliot asking you, in your opinion, 
what is the most exciting part the most exciting part about exploring space well uh, you know i got a lot of exciting things i get to first of all i get to go to antarctica and down to chile all the time which is kind of fun on itself that's the exciting part of what i do but in terms of actually getting the research done uh, and what you learn it's pretty amazing uh, what you understand about uh, how the universe is 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 growing and what i mean by that is that if you go look back in if you look at a distant object say for example the sun the sun is is 8 minutes away from us by the, by the speed of light it takes a photon eight minutes to get from the sun to the earth. So when I'm looking at the sun, you're looking eight minutes into its past, which isn't that exciting. But if you look at a diff distant star, that's say four light years away, that's the closest star, you're looking at the star as it was four years ago, because it took four years for the light to get from the star to us, which again, isn't that interesting. But if I look at a galaxy, which is a billion light years away, well, it took a billion years for that light to get from where it was, when it was emitted to us. And if I go to start a galaxy that's seven billion light years away, you get the idea. I'm looking back at these objects when they're emitting their light billions of years ago. Now, if you think about it, if the universe is 13 billion years old, and I'm looking at objects which are 7 to 10 billion light years away, then I'm looking at them when the universe was a different place, because the universe evolves with time, and so it's a different time. And I'm literally looking back in time at what the universe was like at these stages. And the reason that's important is because I can understand via other means what the universe was like when it was first see the universe now uh, and as, as it is now. And when it first started, the universe was incredibly smooth. What I mean by that is that if I took a hunk of universe and took a hunk of universe right next to it, it was exactly the same to one part in 100,000. Very, very similar to each other. But if you look at the universe today, well, here's the Earth. I mean, we live on it. It's round. But next to the Earth, there's nothing. Right? And I look at our solar system, it's relatively compact and warm, but if I go next to our solar system, there's nothing. If I look at our galaxy, it's very compact from the outside, but next to it, there's nothing. And you can extend this kind of orderly structure up to very, very large scales. And as an astrophysicist, I would like to ask the question, how did it go from being very smooth to being very ordered in a mere 13 billion years? And the answer is there's lots of ways it can do it. It can go travel lots of different paths. Gravity plays a role how the universe you know, is made up, plays a role, all sorts of things play a role in there. And I can make it work, but the problem is there's so many paths I can travel from the beginning to now that I can't really understand the physics of what's going on in the universe. But if I can measure what the universe was like at a bunch of points in between, not just what it was like at the beginning and what it was like now, but all the spots in between, then there's only really one path I can travel from, one, from A to B, from the beginning to where we are now, and I can help understand what physics are involved with this. And that's what we do with our different experiments is we try to understand how the universe is evolving so we can constrain how our understanding of how the universe got from now. So that's the exciting part is really being able to understand how it went together. Well, we've got a question from Amira and from Alex uh, from JCD STEM and SLC. And Amira is wondering how telescopes can give the answers to how the universe evolved, which you just talked about. Uh, when, and she wants to know what's the most amazing thing you've seen through a telescope. Mm -hmm. And Alex wants to know what's been your favorite area of the universe that you've ever looked at. Okay, so let me, uh, let me answer the first one. I don't actually look through my telescopes, unfortunately, because my eye is not sensitive to the the light that I'm looking for I have to build a special camera for it and those cameras cost millions of dollars and they're they're hard to build but uh, the things that when we collect the information that comes through the telescope onto my special camera uh, discovered uh, about a couple years ago that the uh, when you look at these at the galaxies that are out there it turns out that our galaxy is kind of uh, middle-aged getting on in years uh, and it's forming stars at a rate of around four stars per year in our galaxy, which sounds like it might be a lot, but there are 100 billion stars in our galaxy, so four per year is not all that many compared to that. But when we looked at galaxies that were further away, um, we discovered that about half the age of the universe ago, or about seven billion light years away, or seven billion years ago, um, galaxies like ours were forming stars at a rate which were hundreds of times the rate at which we form it now. So they were like wow. young and invigorated. And, and doing Maybe. lots and lots of stuff. And since then, we seem to have slowed down. And that was a little exciting when we figured that out and you know, what was going on with the details of that. And uh, 
Then the next question, what's what's the most exciting spot in the universe to look at? Entire universe. So it's all exciting to me. Uh, so the you know I don't look at just one little tiny spot. I look at the whole thing and say, what's it doing as a system, not as an individual thing? And that is actually one of the distinctions between an astronomer and a cosmologist or an astrophysicist is we really look at the whole system rather than just the individual parts. Well, we have a couple of questions about your movie Blast. Um, Madawaska, Maine. They watched your, this class watched uh, the first half of Blast yesterday and they had some questions about it. They had, um, what if something hits the balloon and what's inside the balloon? We'll start with those two. Okay, so what if something hits the balloon? We hope it doesn't. <laughs> Uh, but the balloon is pretty big. Uh, it's hard to get a scale from it from the movie, but it's uh, it's a 40 million cubic feet. Your class to figure that out, but uh, it's a sphere, you know roughly a sphere. Uh, but generally speaking, if you filled it up inside a football stadium, it would push the people out of the seats. So it's 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 that kind of volume. It's it's very big. Um, we fill them with uh, with helium, so it's very similar to the balloon that you might have. Uh, Balloon at a party. The difference is that our balloon is is uh, if you kind of feel a party balloon, you kind of feels taut and under pressure. Our balloon more feels like you filled up a bag with it rather than rather than a uh, than a, like than a, a springy. Bag uh, kind of thing? Yeah, like a grocery bag. Yeah, very. In fact, the material that the balloon is made up is made up out of the grocery bag material. Same stuff. Um, there you go. So, <laughs> so the, uh, um, but helium doesn't uh, doesn't blow up. If you if you light it on fire, so if something hits it, it just gets a leak in it down slowly. Now they used to make those balloons and fill them with hydrogen, which is a different story. Uh, and they used to have some very spectacular uh, accidents, and then they would they would burn. But ours don't, don't do that anymore. Well, good, good. That's a I'd say that was a, a good move on your part. <laughs> um, they also want to know when was the Sweden launch. And can you do anything if the balloon goes off track? And basically, how do you find it if it does? Sweden launch is a perfect example of it going off track. Uh, the, uh, the Sweden launch was actually in 2005, so quite some time ago. I don't think I'll ever go back to Sweden. And one of the reasons was Sweden, if you look at the pictures, you'll see that Sweden was, is see all that green around there? We, we hate green. Green is wet and wet is bad. And, uh, and it got our, t it kind of messed up our telescope a little bit, so we don't like being around there. Uh, Antarctica is very cold and dry, so we like it there. But the the Sweden launch was supposed to go, um, and we were under the landed in Alaska. Um, and uh, the problem was that it drifted north because there were some storms over Greenland, and even though we're really above the storms a lot, we still get affected by updrafts apparently. And it pushed us a little bit too far north, which wouldn't have been a problem, except that we would have missed. Uh, Alaska and we would have had to fly over Russia and Russia doesn't want us flying over them so we had to cut the balloon down in northern uh, Canada in the middle of nowhere I mean in the middle of nowhere and uh, uh, now not finding it well they have a lot of tracking devices on it to, to make sure we, we know where it is uh, normally when we bring the balloon down they actually fly a plane below the balloon at around 35,000 feet the balloons at 125,000 feet and you they can see it, and they, they cut it down. They, they send a command to, to cut it down, and they watch it come down. They can see it land. But we landed during a rather large storm, and so we had to cut it down remotely. And it, um, there, and it was a bunch – there were – it was really in the middle of it. It was about 200 miles from the nearest village. And, the, and when I mean village, I mean a little tiny village, very, very small. Wow. There's just so many chaos factors <laughs> going on. Exactly. Uh, Jenna – she asks if you if you see things that are a few light years ago, how do people know what's happening in space right now? That's a really good question. The answer is you can't know what's happening until the light gets to you. Now you can take a guess at what it's doing because you can imagine. And again, this is one of the tenets of you know, one of the uh, you know things that we, we kind of try to believe in is that one part of the universe is the same as the next part of the universe. You know, so you take a big chunk here and you go the next adjacent one and on, and on average it's roughly the same. So now I can look at a galaxy which is very far away and I can say to myself, well, that's what it was like say three billion years ago, but I can imagine on average that galaxy is going to look like galaxies that we have today. So I can't know exactly what's going on there, but I can guess what it's evolved into. But, you know, part of the fun is, is, is figuring out 
what the different types of things objects are and what they might actually be, how they're pointing to what we see in the, in the, the present day universe. And we look at the old ones and we say, well, where are they going to, not old, the far away ones, where are they going to end up in the, you know, in the, uh, you know, the set of the set of things that we know about today. You have such a cool job. All right. Yeah. Um, uh, Sharon or Sharon, I'm not sure exactly how to say that name, says, uh, how long does it take to build a telescope? And uh, no, let's see. Go ahead. And, and what's the biggest telescope you've ever worked on? So uh, I just went through this yesterday with my, with my colleagues here to figure out how long it was going to take. To build a, a pretty big telescope is about four years. Uh, from start to finish. So if I, you know, if I wanted to start today with the designing of it, and then you know, when you're building a, one of these telescopes that cost millions of dollars, you can't just say let's let's go to the shop today and start cutting metal. You have to go through a long planning process and a design process and approval process to make sure it's it's correct, and uh, and then you start building it. So once you have all the designs and it's all done and approved, it's about two years. So it takes about two years to figure out what you want to do, and then another two years to to build it and and, and and get it going. Uh, so our telescope in Chile is uh, is six meters in diameter. Uh, that's the one that, that I've designed and built. Uh, the one that I work on in West Virginia, that's a picture you're seeing, well, there's a picture of it in, in Chile right there. Unfortunately, you can't see the telescope. It's behind a, a big screen. But uh, the one in West Virginia, which I did not build, but I work on, that one's 100 meters in diameter. So it's a, it's a very, very big telescope. In fact, it's the biggest pointable telescope on the Earth. Well, how far away were you able to view? There's another question. Well, the um, when I the I do two types of research. One is looking at actual a bunch of objects, uh, galaxies, and and collections of galaxies, and uh, that we're looking at the objects, individual objects, which could be you know ten or eleven billion light years away. Um, but ultimately, my telescope in in Chile. Uh, is looking at the cosmic microwave background and that's looking at the photon the earliest photons that we can observe and those are about 13.4 billion light years away so and you can't really look at light coming any earlier than that in the universe but we can see uh, the echoes of what happened earlier and that's kind of the challenge of the next stage experiments that we're doing now and so we're trying to build an experiment to do that but it's going to be it's going to be tough all right, I'm just going to pause to just go, squee! That's amazing! Um, okay, I've limited myself to three amazings during this whole conversation. I've gotten two, no more. Okay, um, so from Harley Bliss, Harley asks, what do you do with a problem you can't solve? And what do you do if you're stuck with something that you think you can't solve? And along well, the same line... I don't understand the question. Oh, well, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Have, you, have you been watching the interview? He can solve problems. No. <laughs> um, and uh, let's see, Gayatri, she asks, what's the most difficult and challenging part of your job? So those okay, kind of so, go together. Yeah. So, you know, we face daunting problems all the time. Uh, you know, you, uh, let, me, let me try to put this in perspective. Um, the temp, you guys have probably heard about the centigrade scale. Uh, and uh, the you know what, what the temperature is outside. So it's about 20 degrees centigrade outside today if it's a nice day. Uh, we work in an, another temperature scale, which is very similar. It's called the Kelvin scale. And uh, so the outside temperature now is around 300 degrees Kelvin, if you if you put that in perspective. The sun is about 5,000 degrees Kelvin. The the uh, uh, stars. I mean, the, the, sorry, the the uh, distant galaxies I look at. They're very cold. They're only about 30 degrees Kelvin, so really, really cold. The temperature of the cosmic microwave background is 2.73 degrees Kelvin, so really, really cold. But we don't care about that. That's actually easy to see. We want to look at the fluctuations in the temperature as you go across the sky. How is it different across the sky? And that's measured in uh, uh, a micro Kelvin, so one millionth of a Kelvin. And the signal that I want to look for next is measured in nano Kelvin, or one billionth of a Kelvin. So I'm trying to measure the temperature of something that I can't touch, and I can't, and it's really far away to one or a couple billionths of a degree Kelvin or a degree centigrade, if you like. It doesn't really matter. So really, really, really challenging measurements, and I'm, you know, I'm getting a little nervous about this next one because the to build an instrument that is that sensitive to do that is actually pretty easy. the The problem is 
all the other things that could mimic what you want to see could be you know confuse you. You you think you're looking at the, what you want to look at, but it's something else. And uh, and that's so so easy to do when these signals become very very small. And that's one of the biggest challenges that we're facing right now. It's not necessarily the technology. It's the it's trying to figure out what are all the other things that could go wrong with your measurement that could 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 uh, confuse you or trick you into thinking you're measuring something else. Think what the thing you want. And the next question was, uh, oh, I can't remember what the next one was. What's the most difficult and challenging part of your job? Ah, uh, dealing with students. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> we have a lot of teachers in the room, but uh, you know, I have a, I have a, my collaboration now. The, the group that I, that I'm kind of in charge of, uh, of getting to work together is 160 scientists, and uh, you know, there's 160 people with many of them have, most of them have. Uh, PhDs, so they're doctors in astrophysics already, and they have uh, enormous egos, and they all want to do one thing, and it's trying, they, they call it herding cats. So how do you get all these people to to go in the same direction and, and achieve a common goal? And uh, and that kind of, that aspect is, is pretty challenging. And so, you know, learning how to communicate, you know, how to how to speak to people and how to, how to uh, communicate your ideas and convince them and get them to work together, that's incredibly challenging. Uh, and you know, eventually you have to do that kind of thing. Uh, technically speaking, what's the most challenging stuff is uh, basically just keeping my experiments running. The the experiment in Chile has been going for almost ten years now, and this you know, and I face problems every day with it. You know, I, I just got off the phone with the my my engineers in Chile, and last night the generator blew up, which is kind of kind of extreme. And the uh, you know we have, we have to generate our own power yeah. and. So you know, I have to learn, now I have to learn how to be a diesel mechanic, and uh, so the next day you might have to learn how to be a, a software person to, to write to write software. The next day you might have to learn how to be a cryogenic engineer to fix your refrigerators and so forth. So all these things, you know, the challenge is basically keeping it all going and trying to keep abreast of of all of the different topics that you have to know about. That sounds so incredibly fun. I mean, it seems like the challenge is the fun when you're when you're going through it's this. Generator blowing. That's not very yeah, no, no. <laughs> you got to get a new generator now. Um, I, I, I just have a quick question about your students. Um, do you often include your students when you go? I, you, you said you had a picture of a. Yeah. Of well, a so, so there's a picture of my students. If you go back to the uh, the picture of the students in Antarctica. I think we have one to show. Uh, yeah, so that that's a good picture. Now, if you go, now of course. You guys have to understand what I consider a student is what you probably probably guys probably consider an adult, <laughs> but uh, uh, that's not. In other words, these, these are people who have already gotten, uh, have already gone through college, and now they're what's called uh, doctoral students, which means they're trying to get their PhD in uh, in astrophysics. And I'm looking at this picture here, and if I go from the left side to the right side, uh, I see a student, a student, a student, a student, me with a beard, an old guy, another student. Another student, a student, a student, and a student. So basically, the whole experiment is built by uh, by what we would call graduate students or, or doctoral students who are, who are doing this. Now, keep in mind these 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 people are uh, are working for maybe five to seven years after they graduated college in order to um, do the kind of research that we're doing and to learn everything they need to know so they can go off on their own and do their own research. Wow. Well, what is your favorite part of your job? This is from Olivia. Well, you asked me what my biggest challenge was, and I said the students. And of course, my favorite part of my job is working with my students. So the, uh, you know, I, you know, it's a, it's a lot of fun to be able to, uh, to take you know, somebody comes in and uh, the they're they're you know very young. They've got just out of out of college. They don't really know what's going on. And then over the course of, you know, I've been working with these people for you work with them very closely for five or six years, and at the end. They're, you know, they're, uh, they're now got their PhD. They know more about their topic than you do, and uh, it's a lot of fun. And then you see them go off, and uh, they do start doing their own things, and that's that's very that's very satisfying. Well, this is a good time to shift and talk about how you got to where you are today. And we've got a couple of questions about. Uh, well, here's from Connor. Connor wonders, what part of science did you like the most in school? I assume that means like younger uh, school. Younger school, I had a bit of a uh, an advantage. My my father is actually a, a physicist as well, uh, so I grew up uh, going to the big national laboratories where they were doing what's called high energy physics and hanging around people who were doing that 
all the time. So I kind of thought that's the way everybody did everything. They, you know, of course, you know, all everybody, everybody you talk to has a PhD in physics or a PhD in something else, and that's the way things are. Uh, so I kind of grew up thinking, you know, having a, a, a lot of interest in in math and in science, uh, particularly in in, in physics. Uh, you know, when you're young. And you're in high school, you you you're going to learn more about uh, just very very general physics. You have to think about learning physics or any science really, or any basically any topic. It's kind of like learning a language. Uh, in school, you're learning how to how to the basics of the grammar and how to speak it and so forth. But it's not until you go out into the real world that you become fluent and you really can can hold a conversation and, and do real writing with it. Science is very much the same thing. In uh, in high school, you might take a normal a physics course where you learn what we call mechanics, but basically throwing balls and doing whatever with them to calculate how far they go. That's, you know, much in my day-to-day -day work. But uh, but the point is, that's the stepping stone to learning the next thing, which is electromagnetism, and the next thing, which is maybe modern physics and quantum mechanics, and the next thing, which is uh, astrophysics and so forth. And you you have to you have to take all these steps uh, to 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 getting where you you know where you want to be. So I really enjoyed uh, the math and physics. Of course, it, it takes a lot of math uh, to be able to do um, the kinds of things that we do. And so I, uh, you know, you take as many math courses as you can in high school, um, which can be uh, all the way up to calculus and beyond. And then you get to college and you, you take more math. And uh, you know, whatever science you decide you're interested in, you need to you need to start it pretty early. And the reason I say that is when you get to college. It's sometimes people say, "What's your major?" and that's the standard question. And uh, it's, it's relatively easy to move back and forth between, "Oh, I, I want to be a communications major, I want to be an English major, I want to major in French or something like that." And you can kind of catch up pretty quickly in in those fields. In physics and chemistry and biology, you basically have to start out right away, saying, "You know, I'm I'm taking the physics courses because there's so many courses you have to take between when you start and when you finish that it's hard to finish them in four years unless you start from." Uh, from day one, uh, but then you do that. You eat a lot of physics, and and uh, what you do after that is uh, I did a lot of research when I was an undergraduate. So I was in a laboratory very much like mine at the University of Wisconsin, and I, I my mentor. I visit him every once in a while. Still, he's uh, it's been I graduated in 1988, so uh, and he's still around, and we still we still talk and uh, and chat every once in a while, and uh, but. Because I had a major in physics and I did a lot of research, I said I want to apply to graduate school. And graduate school is where you get your your PhD. And uh, so then you go to graduate school. I went to the University of California, Berkeley, and I spent five years there. And after that, you get your your what's called a PhD, which is a doctorate degree. And I did that studying the cosmic microwave background. And then you're still not ready yet. Then they, then they, they still everybody still considers you a student. You're, you know, but you're now you're almost 30 years old, and you've got your PhD, and they can call you a doctor. But still not good enough. Then uh, you do what's called postdoctoral work, and that can last anywhere from two to four years. And uh, I did mine at Princeton University. I did that for two years, and then you apply for a faculty position, which is what I'm doing now. And then you're still not good enough because you start that job, and they say we're going to evaluate you for the next five to seven years or five years. And if at the end of those five years it seems like you're still good enough, then we'll give you a job. And so that, so you're not until you're almost 36 or 37 years old until you actually finish this track and you're done. So it's a long, long way, but it's a lot of fun along the way. So it's, it's, it's doesn't seem, doesn't seem so bad when you're doing it. It just seems like I've done nothing with my life now. Thanks a lot. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, that's a lot of school. That's amazing. And it just, it seems like you have to have, um, you a, a lot of stick to itiveness. You have to have yes, a, a exactly right. Yeah, you, you know. do and love what you do to get there, and that's that's fantastic because yeah, I, I tell my I tell my students if you're not if you're not enjoying it and you don't want to be here all the time, it probably isn't the right field for you, right? Because it's 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 a lot of work, and you you can't sit there and say oh, it's a job. It's more like this is fun. This is what I want to do every day. I get up so I can do this, and uh, and that's and you know so you put a lot into it, but you get a lot out of it. Well, I have a, a couple of people who uh, were asking about your dad. Sophia Shea and Mito, or Mito, I'm not sure. Um, they wanted to kind of uh, you to just talk a little bit about how your dad inspired you to be a physicist. And Hannah wants to know uh, why you chose to be a physicist over, say, an engineer. 
All right, so let me let me ask the, fir the first question first. My father, of course, he, he's a high energy physics physicist, which means he studies the very small. So they you know they they smash particles together at very high energies to understand what comes out from the collision to study to study uh, fundamental particles and fundamental physics. Um, so I think what I got from that is a uh, well, he's a very smart guy, um, and uh, you know it's it's fun to be around people who are really smart. Uh, is uh, uh, you know, gets an appreciation of how the universe is put together, and you know, to you know, to basically uh, inquisitiveness about that, and to try and figure out what's going on. Uh, the the of course the nice thing I got from him, of course, is a lot of advice on how to you know on how to go through this, manage all that twenty years of education that that is talked about. Uh, so I think he's been a very very inspiring guy. Now, now in fact, I have to say that he is now uh, how old is my father? He must be one. Uh, and uh, uh, about the time he turned 70, he came to me and said, well, I'm kind of done with high energy physics. I want to do astrophysics instead like you do. And so he said, can he, can he work in my lab and, uh, and work for me? And so he's been actually in my lab downstairs for the past uh, 11, uh, well, yeah, 11, 11 years or so uh, doing, his own, doing his own astrophysics research. So he's still active. He's still here. Now, what was, I think the second question was, you remember? Oh, it was um, why did you decide to be a physicist over an engineer? I often wonder that. Uh, now, I, I think I could have I could have been a pretty good engineer uh, and uh, and had a lot of fun doing that. So if you go, I spent a lot of time at NASA and working with NASA engineers uh, on different projects. I I advise them on satellite missions and so forth. And uh, those engineers are pretty good. It's a lot of fun to work with them as well. I mean, they have big projects and they get to build big things, and it's it seems like it seems like a lot of fun. And a lot of what I do is engineering uh, as well. I mean, I get up, you know, my downstairs, my telescope is being built, and it's it's an engineering project. And uh, so I, I I would think I'd have a lot of fun here there. The advantage of being a faculty member doing astrophysics, I get to do whatever I want, and uh, you know, I, I kind of like that too. So engineers are good. My son, of course, wants to be an engineer, and so that's uh, I, I can't I, I like it. Yes, and I adore that the I adore that the the NASA engineers are pretty good. They're pretty good. No, they're pretty good. No, 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 I'm, good. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, Fiona Deach from Summit Learning Charter wonders: When you decided on your career, did you ever doubt that you were smart enough to actually do it? And did you ever struggle with math? And Sophia has a similar question: Were you ever told that you couldn't do it? Never told I couldn't do it, but I really certainly felt I couldn't do it uh, a lot, all the way through. I mean, you go to college, you know, you every step of the way as you move along in in your education, you're going to be confronted with people who are who are just as smart as you are, right? Or or they could be smarter. Uh, being, of course, in my department in physics, there are a lot of people who are smarter than I am. Uh, you, know, you know, it depends on what you want to do. I mean, they they have different people have different skills and and so forth. So I think that what you have to uh, Fun be your guide. I mean, if you're not having fun doing it, then why bother, right? And uh, there must be something else that that that's 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 more enjoyable. And so occasionally, I'd, I'd say, you know, if I go down this road, it's gonna, you know, this is not what I'm enjoying. I don't really want to learn that. So why bother going that direction? Let's choose the direction I want to go. And for me, that's more building stuff. It's more designing stuff, and it's it's more doing things like that. But I have friends down the hallway. It might be, you know, understanding the quantum mechanics of the first microsecond of the universe and you know and standing at the board and doing differential equations and math and really detailed math all day long uh, and they enjoy that and I you know and that and that's great so I would say that uh, all the time you will you know depends on who you are but your personality will probably you know to doubt yourself and that you know uh, I would say you know you need to be careful about what it is your perception of yourself is and what other people perceive of you most likely uh, people are really impressed with you and uh, and you should uh, continue forward and not and not worry about it too much. Well, I have a question from a student. Uh, this is a this is a doozy here. Uh, how did you wind up cleaning toilets? Where would you find that one from? I, a student asked this one. <laughs> I I, I'm wondering if it has a basis in I don't, I don't know where profile. Maybe, maybe movie, I can't remember. I had a job in high school uh, at the local supermarket and uh, I was the lowest of the low. You know, I did, I did collecting the carts, but there was a bathroom in the back of that that store. And you know, guess who got to clean it? So, and and same thing. I, I had a job at a uh, at a at a pharmacy delivering delivering uh, drugs for the pharmacy, and the driver got to clean the toilet. So that was my job. Hey, but, all right. 
<laughs> you gotta, you gotta have a job. But some, yeah. Somebody's got to clean the toilet. Exactly. Your parents don't, you know, all day long. You're, somebody cleans the toilet in your house. So there you go. It's true. You teach the children how to clean it. That's, that's where we're going. Um, we have a comment from Gabrielle from Summit Learning Charter. Um, Gabrielle wonders, what was the biggest struggle you faced when you were getting your PhD? Um, and uh, she says, I've wanted a career in physics for quite some time, uh, preferably in astrophysics or th theoretical physics. What was the biggest struggle when I was a, uh, you know, I remember my, uh, my PhD years quite fondly. Uh, you know, I had a lot of fun. I mean, I went, I went and built, built instruments and we flew them, flew balloons from, uh, from Texas and New Mexico. Uh, I think uh, I was married at the time, and I, I spent a long, long, many months away from my from my wife. And we you know we were quite young. I married at 24, which I think is young for getting married. And uh, 25 years old, and I have to leave. I have to go out of town for three months at a time, and uh, that's not that's not very much fun. I would say uh, I'd rather be home. Uh, or I could have gotten her to come to Texas with me, but I don't think she wanted to go. Uh, so that was challenging, and I think again, re relating to the previous question, is you have doubts about how good you are all the way through this process, and you know, are you are you going to make it to the, you know, are you going to succeed, and and so forth. And I think that that worrying about whether or not you're going to do is is the not not fun part of it, and you just have to get past that and 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 go through it. And again, what was the second question, or was there a second question? Uh, no, she was just telling me a little bit about herself, but I, I'm thinking. Well, I, would say, I would say go 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 get a degree in physics. It's great. Apply to Penn. All right, do you hear that, Gabrielle? Just do it. You pen. <laughs> we um, uh, let's let's go ahead and just transition to talking about uh, the future for you. Um, but Hamang Vasu wonders what you do for fun. Oh, what do I do for fun? I have uh, I have I like to mountain bike ride. So I have a I I, uh, I have a bunch of mountain bikes, and I uh, I go to Colorado uh, a couple times a year to mountain bike ride there, and I mountain bike ride around here in Philadelphia. So I, the way I tell my uh, my colleagues who think I'm crazy is my vacations consist of doing physical activity until I completely exhausted and risking my life mountain bike riding. So well, that's what I do for fun. Wonderful. So, but I also, I also now have discovered I like to build my own bikes. And so now I'm building my own bikes, which is a real problem because now I have too many bikes <laughs> and too many projects possibly. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and we have a lot of questions coming in, uh, sort of personal questions, not not personal, personal. But Matthew wonders, um, do you play Pokemon Go? And if if so, what team are you on? No, my son does though. Although we haven't, he hasn't. He seems to have gotten bored of it. And I followed him around for a while, uh, trying to understand the game. I don't quite get it, but I know it involves a lot of swiping. There is maybe swiping to catch your Pokemon thing. <laughs> Anna wants to know who is your favorite scientist. My father, uh, who's uh, you know obviously my a big, played a big role in my life. Uh, you know, I, I look back on on what people impress me the most, right? And you you look back at them, what the smartest people. So if you go far enough back, I mean, really. He was really smart, and uh, you look back at the history of what what he was able to do. I mean, the guy invented calculus so he could understand the motion of the planet. I mean, just along the way, he invented calculus, and uh, that's uh, that's really impressive. Uh, if you look into the nearer terms, I mean, I have a, a couple of my my advisor when I was in graduate school was was incredibly talented in many ways, but one of the things I I found most admirable about him was his ability to communicate. Uh, communicate what he was doing to his uh, to other people, and uh, and one of the things that I think people who are interested in science and engineering in general should realize: you can't just blow off uh, all the rest of it. Uh, I'm reading a, a a proposal that one of my students is one of my young students has written, and it's horrible. I mean, I want to help her, right? But the point is, her English is really bad, and she needs to you know you need to learn how to be able to write and how to be able to express yourself uh, so that you can convince people. That what you're doing is worthwhile, and then once you discover something, you need to be able to, and what it is, and that involves being able to speak. It involves being able to write, and so there's a, there's a lot more. There's a lot involved to it. Well, Sophia Flores has a question about you and your background. Again, did you ever want to be an astronaut? I filled out the application once. Last year, <laughs> when I was a. <laughs> Uh, no, no. When I when I first uh, you speaking about this this uncertainty in your in your in your in yourself. When I first started my job here at Penn, I was worried that I wouldn't 
survive the five year, they call it tenure process. And so, you know, midway through that, I said, well, I'll just fill out the astronaut application for. I mean, you know, I've got a PhD in physics and I do all these other things. Maybe, maybe they'll accept me. I never really turned it in though. I, I, I did fine here. It's actually, the job looks exciting, but I think it's, it probably involves a lot, a lot of training, training, training for a very short period of, of a lot of excitement. But I think it would still be worth it. Me too. I think so too. Um, Madeline M wants to know who is your favorite superhero. I think I'm kind of partial to Superman, you know, because he is super. Uh, you ever watch those Batman with Superman cartoons they have on YouTube? They're pretty funny. But anyway, uh, yeah, I like Superman. Uh, Gayatri wants to know what you think is the greatest scientific invention. Ooh. Scientific invention. Uh, I would say the thing that's been very, a lot of you, very uh, helpful to everybody was the the electron microscope uh, back in the day. This is not what I do, but looking at the very small, being able to use uh, instead of light, being able to use electrons to actually image things was an amazing uh, uh, just transform the whole field of condensed matter physics. The things of looking at the very small and. Uh, I would say those guys. Those guys are pretty good. That, that was a, that was a good move. Uh, we have a couple of questions coming in here. Whoa, lots of questions coming in here. Um, from Mrs. Couch's class, what advice would you give a seventh grade student that is interested in learning more about astronomy and physics? The JCD STEM says, "What advice do you have middle, for middle school and high school students interested in space science?" Um, uh, so another from Miss Hyatt's class in second grade, another STEM class. They all want to know um, what your advice would be to someone who's okay, well, interested in doing what you do. If you want to become, a, if you want to do what I do, then as, as I said, you know, take a lot of math and physics, or, or take a lot of math and science through your through your career. You know, bolster your interest in these things. There's an enormous amount of resources uh, to. Uh, to help along. I mean, back in the day when you know there were barely computers when I was growing up at your age, uh, and uh, the but now the amount of information that's available that's actually geared towards uh, students your age and both in the the seventh and seventh grade and up is amazing. The 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 Space Sciences Institute, the Hubble Space Sciences Institute down in Baltimore, they have a uh, uh, special. Um, Web web based uh, things for for uh, for understanding this. So there's there's an enormous number of NASA uh, resources available for for doing that. What what I would also suggest is to to visit. Uh, there's uh, you know the the my the observatory in Greenbank, West Virginia has an enormous a great science center for doing this. Uh, the uh, the NASA facilities also have great great science centers that are really geared towards uh, getting people going. Here in Philadelphia, of course, we have a science museum, the Franklin Institute. Um, and go and see those things. Now, as you get older um, and get into high school, uh, I get requests all the time. Uh, not that I'm saying I want 5,000 requests, but I get requests all the time from high school students who want to come in and just hang out in the lab and see what you know, see what people do. And if you're near, if you're near a place where somebody's doing this, you know, sending them a quick email saying, you know, you know, I don't want to bother you, but it would be kind of interesting to see to see what's going on in you know in a real research environment. You can ask, and and they'll, and then maybe they'll say yes. That would be really amazing because then you'd actually get to see what the work is that's being done at that moment too. Um, oh, Adi see, dropped out for. Oh, all right. Let's see. Can you hear me now? Gotcha. You're back. Okay, great. Audit wants to know: uh, Do you think the movie Interstellar could be possible? I when I when they came on that movie, I gave an entire class just on that. Not a not an entire uh, about two lectures on the Interstellar movie to. Uh, to, to show what was going on. Uh, do I think Interstellar, the, the uh, uh, no, no, sorry. <laughs> I don't think it's possible. But it's it's fun to think about. And, you know, Kip Thorne, who is the uh, the science uh, advisor for that, he wrote this, the science behind it. He wrote a whole book called The Science of Interstellar, uh, which has a lot of, a lot of interesting uh, um, applications of, of, of gravity and, and how gravity behaves on when these are very extreme uh, things and, and all his math is correct in terms of you know how these planets behaved around the uh, around the, the massive black hole. Uh, the bit about being able to go back in time and, and tickle his daughter's watch 
secondhand I was watching, I'm not quite sure I'm into that. But the, everything else was kind of interesting to do just mathematically to see how, how it worked out. I think I think you saw that movie in a different way than most people see that movie. That's you don't want to see science fiction movies with a physicist. It's 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 tough. <laughs> Adim Akbel says, uh, "I'm hoping to be something in astronomy. I'm considering astrophysics, but what else might be similar to that?" In astronomy, I would say uh, the you know people study all sorts of things. I mean, you know the the. The, the hot topics, things that we're people really interested in, varies, you know, decade to decade. Right now, it's looking for, for extra, extrasolar planets, looking for planets outside our solar system. And that really is the next, uh, the next target that people are going for. And it's really hard to do, uh, to find a, uh, and, you know, we know they're there. We've detected their presence by watching them either block the light from their, the star they're going around, or from how they gravitationally pull on the star that they're going around. But nobody's ever actually imaged one, and certainly nobody's ever imaged something which is in what we call the habitable zone, which is a, a planet which is not too close but not too far away, just right like the Earth is, so you could have maybe liquid water on, on its surface. And uh, so what I would do is, you know, you, you as things go forward, I mean, astronomy is one of these fields where it's changing, you know, you know, every month, right, you see something new that somebody has somebody has discovered. Either they're doing something on Mars, or they're doing something with an observation of a distant galaxy, or they're doing what I'm doing. And, uh, you know, just dive into it and say, you know, what really, really intrigues me. I had one of my students come back who was an undergraduate. A couple of years ago, she went off and worked in finance, literally in, in New York City. She came back and said, I want to get a PhD in astrobiology. And I said, that's great. And we discussed all the places that she could do this. But she basically followed the field for a couple of years and really felt that was the where she wanted to go. And, uh, and I would really encourage that, that kind of attitude. And, and, and in fact, taking, you know, taking some time to, to choose what you want is, is the right thing because you're going to be stuck with it for a while. So you want to you know, choose the right, you know, the right direction. Well, just to let you know, we have a tweet from at Miss J Van who says there are 60 students enjoying this live Q&A with you right now. So uh, I was just one of our classrooms sending you a shout out. And Mackenzie asks, what are you interested in doing for the future uh, as a project? Um, so I have, uh, I have a couple of things and my... Uh, I thought you in, might. What in, <laughs> I got a lot of things I want to do, but the, uh, uh, you know, it used to be that I, I'd be worried about getting funding, you know, getting the resources I needed to, to do my work. Uh, I have a lot of ideas. Uh, I've been now uh, either blessed or cursed with getting lots and lots of funding to do all the things I want to do, and uh, um, and that's and that's really good. But it still doesn't keep me from coming up with ideas, more ideas about other things I want to do. And uh, I like to I like to build these these telescopes that fly on balloons, and I have one in production right now. But there's another one I want to do, and uh, and that involves a uh, kind of a, a more specialized telescope and. And I don't want to get too much details, but it actually looks at the, the the interstellar dust, the dust that's between the stars and our galaxy, to understand how it's how it's behaving, because it, it frankly it interferes with my other measurements, and I want to understand it really well. And so I, I would like to get that one going. Uh, I'm building a new observatory right now in in Chile. Uh, we just started that project about two months ago, and I think that's going to take me about ten years. That's going to be a long time. So uh, so I'm you know I'm kind of booked, but uh, but I have lots of students, and I, you know, I kind of give them my ideas, and we discuss ideas, and we, you know, we we collaborate, and we do things in the future. Peyton wants to know what's the most interesting thing you've seen during your whole job. Interesting thing I've seen during my whole job. Let me see. Well, I did when I go to Antarctica. I uh, I go to the coast of Antarctica to fly the balloons, and they go around the continent. But because I, I know the person from the National Science Foundation who runs the whole continent, I called him up and I said, hey, can I get on the plane to go to the South Pole? And he said, sure, get on the plane to go to the South Pole. So I, one day I just I strode up to the, the plane, got on it, we flew to the South Pole, and I put my hand on top of the mark at the South Pole, got my picture taken, did a selfie, and then uh, and I came back. <laughs> you know, that was pretty interesting, I have to say, on the scale of things. You, know, not, you don't get to do that very often in your life. Yes, I, I haven't gotten there yet, but that's one of my goals, definitely. Um, Gosser Earth in Space class wonders, can you ride a gravitational wave on a rocket? Can gravity shrink space, allowing you to move faster through it? 
Yeah, so the, the uh, you may have heard about last year, there was a really big measurement that uh, talked about a gravity wave being detected for the first time. That's from the LIGO Observatory. And I, I know the guy who I really hope wins the Nobel Prize for because he's really nice and he deserves it. Uh, but uh, the, um, and, you know, we're physicists here in the, at the department, so we immediately get this information and we start to calculate what it means to do this. And what a gravity wave is, is basically stretching space. And, uh, and this gravity wave emanated from a, the spin-in of two, two large objects. Uh, they they, they kind of spin in together gravitation, and they, they coalesce, and they emit this big gravity wave on, along the way. And so we calculated how close you would have to be to this so that this stretching of space would actually tear you apart, because it was fun to do. And it turned out to be really close. Uh, but that's the kind of thing you're talking about here is, you know, how, how intense does the gravity wave have to be so it can actually affect me physically, you know, can actually do something to me. And it turns out if you were, you know, just to address your question, if you were to try to harness that energy the way that you're talking about it, you would be so close to the event that's happening that at the same time as giving you this energy that you're talking about, it would probably tear you apart, uh, which is a problem, uh, you know, if you if you get torn in half or bits while you're driving a gravity wave. But there is energy there, and the energy certainly is harnessable. Uh, but again, uh, the amount of energy that we're talking about that actually reaches the, reaches the Earth from these objects is very, very, very tiny. Uh, in fact, that measurement essentially moved two mirrors that were, that were several kilometers apart by, I think, uh, a thousandth of the diameter of an atom or something like that. So very, very small amount of motion. You'd have to be very close to the object that's doing it, creating the gravity wave to experience anything different than that. Really, really close. <laughs> um, really close. Let's see. Sachin says, Mark Devlin, can you tell us something really cool about dark matter and how you're trying to make it visible? So the really cool thing about dark matter, of course, is that it's dark. And the thing that, 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 uh, that's interesting, but let me, let me just explain to you what dark matter is for those people who don't know what we're talking about. Um, when you look at, our, at, a, at a galaxy, galaxy really, uh, it's rotating, and you can see the stars rotating around the center of the galaxy. And just like in our solar system, where the planets go around our sun, the rate at which we go around the star, our sun, is dictated by the mass of the star and our distance from the star. Um, if you turn that problem around, by understanding how far an object is away and how fast it's rotating, or going around the other object, you can calculate the mass of the thing that's going around. And that's how we, that's actually how we measure the mass of the sun um, in galaxies. And you, you look at the stars and how they're going around the center of the galaxy, and you use that to calculate the mass of the galaxy, and you find uh, that it's less than 10%, I'm sorry, the mass is 10 times more than the stars that you see there. In other words, you add up the mass of all the stars, and the mass of the galaxy is 10 times more than that, which means there's 10 times as much mass there as you can account for. And that's why they call it dark matter, because you can't see it. It's not visible with the stars. And in my, when I teach astronomy, I, I ask my class, I say, can anybody give me an example of what might be dark matter? You know, what, what could it be? And there's lots of things. It could be the dust that I'm looking at and that I, that I talk about. It could be planets that are just sitting around, not their parent stars. So there's a whole bunch of planets out there. We call them machos for massive, compact halo objects. It could be fundamental particles, we call them neutrinos. It could be anything. And what scientists do is they consider each one of those things, and then they say, well, if it was this, I find a different way of fi figuring it out. And it turns out it can't be the dust. And the planets, the machos, say, well, it could be that. And we went out and looked for them. And we found them, but not nearly enough. And it could, you know, every single one, we try to check it off the block. And we really are down to some kind of particle that we don't understand. And we call those particles WIMPs instead of machos, which it stands for weakly interacting massive particles. And uh, the, uh, but the point about them is that we don't understand anything about it. And that's what's fun, so, so fun about it. I've had friends who have been measuring, looking for this stuff for 30 years, right? And they still haven't found it yet, but they're still having fun looking for it. And when they do find it, it's going to be really, really cool. And I'm, I have confidence that before I die, somebody will have detected one, but we'll, we'll, we'll have to wait. We will have a party. A big, right. Whoa, big party dark matter one. party. KK wonders, yeah. what do you think the most exciting, the most exciting space discovery ever was? I think that the uh, the expansion of the universe is pretty much it. That was Edwin Hubble did this in the 1920s, 
And what he found is that no matter what direction he pointed his telescope, if he looked at galaxies, which are you know, pretty far away from us, they were going away from us in that direction, they're going away from us in that direction, they're going away from us in that direction. Everywhere he looked, they're all going away from us, which makes it seem like you know we're, we're something we're, we're repelling the rest of the universe, but it really doesn't look, work like that. What he found, it, he found is that space itself was expanding, and uh, that's strange. And if space itself is expanding, then you can think about the universe getting bigger and bigger and bigger as time goes forward, but as a cosmologist, what I've got to think about is what happens it goes the other way. As you go back in time, that means space is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and more and more compact. And that is actually what led to the theory, the, the Big Bang Theory, is that if the universe is expanding as time goes forward, then it's contracting as time goes backwards, and eventually it contracts to almost a point. And that point is really hot and energetic, and that's where the Big Bang comes from. That's kind of, uh, I'm going to use my last one. That's awesome. Okay. Awesome. Uh, so we have time for one more question from Seth. Why is this job important? I think it's important for, for a bunch of reasons. I mean, one is, again, I, I educate an awful lot of students, just like your teachers are educating you um, in, in grade school and high school. I, I pick it up at the, at the college level and at the, uh, um, at the graduate school level. So I teach two types of students. One ones who are uh, you know, getting their PhDs. And then I also teach, uh, often teach what's called an Astronomy One course, which is just basically a general physics course, and a general astronomy course. And I get a lot of students who are, again, they're not science majors. Uh, they're taking the course out of interest, you know, general interest in astronomy. And you know, I teach several hundred a year. And what's important to me about that is that it may be the only science course they get in their entire lives. And it's up to me to convince them, or not to convince them, to just to show them that things are knowable. And what I mean by that is that it's not, you know, if I were to show my cell phone to somebody even 100 years ago, it would look like magic, right? And because it's so incredibly unknown to them. And what I want to say to them is just because you don't understand something on the first side doesn't mean it's not knowable. And, you know, we do things in my class, like I just show them, you know, what's the force of gravity? How does gravity work? And with basically two equations, you can figure out dark matter, for example, and why it's there and, and what its properties are. And, uh, and really letting people know that they don't have to give up just because they don't understand it the first time is, is really important to me. And I think that that's important. Now, if you're wondering whether I develop technologies that are going to be useful or going to save, you know, save humanity, probably not. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, consider what I do more like art. You know, it's a, uh, you know, you, you can develop an appreciation for it. And, you know, humans really just want to know what's going on in the universe, and I provide a lot of that knowledge. And uh, hopefully we can make something of it in the future. Unfortunately, we are out of time. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking this time and sharing with us. This has been really, really wonderful. Thank you, Mark. No problem at all. Bye, guys. Thanks for coming. And our next event will be on November 10th. Uh, we'll be featuring STEM role model Meg Lauman. She's a conservation biologist at the California Academy of Sciences, and she travels with around, around the world conserving and researching forests. She's all the way up in the canopy, Her Highness Canopy Meg. Well, so until then, for Jason Learning, I'm Haley Nelson. See you next time on Jason Live.